8, 7, 6, 5, 4. И вместе! 2, 1! Поехали! Конференция для разработчиков. Код Фест 2015 торжественно открыта! Дино Эспозита. Вау! There are moments in, in, in the life, in, in my life, in which I regret I don't have a newer phone and I, not, I cannot take a selfie. <laughs> uh, it would be so nice to stay like this and take uh, a selfie. But anyway, no selfie. But, uh, well, 30 minutes, it's a, it's a too short time. In, in, normally, in 30 minutes, the expected length of this keynote, I can only say hi to, well, everybody, personally. But there are too many people here. So just one sentence before I start with serious things like challenges of modern software development. Budio uh, Tulotna. Uh, okay. I, I have no idea what it means, no idea, but they told me, they recommended when you're on stage, before you start, to say Budio to Lotna. And uh, I hope it doesn't mean that I'm gonna give you $100 from my own pocket. <laughs> that would be a disaster, financial disaster, because of bankruptcy. I see quite a few people here. So imagine $100 per each from my own pocket. No, 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 no way. Challenges of modern software development. Okay, can I ask you a question? Okay, sure. Why do we write software? That's a tough question. I think that we, we write it for uh, fun. Some, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes it's for fun. For ego. <laughs> it's almost for ego, almost always. For money, mm, yes and no, yeah, it's for money, yeah, sure, because we, we make living out of software, but we make living out of software only if we have clients. And, oh. <laughs> there's a, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> to talk, me and you, okay? Face to face, from man to man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's a life. <laughs> Again. No, oh, let, let me. Uh, are you joking? <laughs> okay. Can I ask you a question? What do you do this way? Fun? <laughs> you have an ego. <laughs> <laughs> Very large heat. <laughs> okay, it, it, it's not a joke. <laughs> this is. They know, they, they knew that you know, 30 minutes is a very short time, so they, there was a message to have me go fast, fast, fast. So that in 30 minutes we are done with... I don't ask you questions, right? That's a critical time. Okay? Thank you. Oh, 
Okay. We made it. Anyway, uh, now the serious part. Do we always write software on time and on budget? So we write software for money, for clients, but do we do that respectfully of agreements uh, with uh, customers, so on time and on budget? Mm, rarely. Kidding. <laughs> never. It never happens. It depends. That's a better answer. So it depends. But another question is uh, why? Why this happens? So why we rarely, or it depends, or just kidding, write software on time and on budget? What's wrong with our way of creating software? I don't know if I have an answer, but let me give it a try, and we'll try to figure out together what could be an answer, what is wrong with our current way of planning software. Typically, what we do is, we try to analyze the business domain, we do some sort of domain analysis, whatever that means. There are various, there might be various methodology for doing that, but let's say we do some analysis, and then the analysis leads to an implementation. The amount of work is, uh, I don't know, numbers are always crazy, but let's say that there is a bit of analysis after that starts coding, but the analysis uh, is never, complete most of the time because we have we rush to we have to rush sometimes to start coding and start creating something concrete to show to use so there is some sort of analysis that probably is around the 70 percent and typically we do analysis until we think we get an idea of what we are called to write to create for the customer and uh, once we have the idea we try to imagine a model, a software model, but for the most time, well, software model would be good, but we, what we really do is uh, create a data model that for the most part is relational. And we create a relational data model most of the time just to create an infrastructure that backs the idea that we extra extracted from uh, the analysis, and then we just adjust the code to make it work, and then we put at the, at the end just some user interface on top of everything. So our way of building software still today is for the most part from the DB up. Then came something called domain-driven design. But domain-driven design, DDD, uh, was uh, over the years, because it's, it's, it's a concept, an approach, a methodology that started some uh, 10 years ago, over the years, uh, in my humble, very, very humble opinion, uh, it was misunderstood. There are a, a lot of misconceptions about what DDD was really supposed to do and what it really does, and especially in the, in the past couple of years, when even in the Microsoft space, the Microsoft territory, a lot of people, a lot of gurus, a lot of fanboys started doing, oh, we do DDD. Oh, beautiful, fantastic. And, uh, and they contributed to misconceptions around uh, domain-driven design. It's as easy as the name says. It's design driven by the domain. Now, I think you know Mr. Henry, well, you know, not, not personally, uh, Mr. Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company. He said once, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me, just give us faster horses. He gave, instead, cars. And this is what an effective design driven by the domain, deep understanding of the domain should give cars instead of faster horses. Because faster horses is uh, blindly doing whatever the customer asks. Okay, the customer pays. 
but it pays software developers teams to see its own business grow, improve, be more effective, more efficient. A software model that is driven by the domain is a software that deeply understands the mechanics of the business domain, the expectations, and also the future development. So a well done design would give cars to move people and things instead of just faster horses. The valuable purpose of domain driven design is uh, okay, crunch knowledge, understand, digest, eat and digest as much as possible knowledge about the business, understand the mechanics, learn the language of the business, and then build a model. But model, okay. Domain driven design simply says build a domain model, and a domain model, generally speaking, is a model, a software model that fully represents the mechanics of the business domain. It doesn't mean stop using storage procedures, stop using transaction script patterns, just use objects and build an object model for the domain. This is, in my humble, 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 very humble opinion, a clear misconception. Not that it's wrong, but that's not necessarily, that's not the only purpose. So doing DDD is not necessarily, and not simply building an object model for the domain. We have to start from the requirements. The very important thing about DDD, the valuable point is starting from user requirements to understand, learn the language of the business. Suppose we have a user story. Things like, has a registered customer of an online store, and then in yellow, nouns in blue, verbs, as we read, again, the user story, as a registered customer, of the I buy stuff, stuff online store, I can redeem a voucher. Voucher is now a noun and redeem is a verb related to the voucher. For an order I place, an order can be placed so that I don't actually pay for the ordered items myself. So there is now in this analysis of the user story, apparently, okay, this is nothing new. We, we, we know this since the very beginning of object orientation, since the early days of object-oriented design. The first principle of object-oriented design, mean 1994 or 95, the popular book from the Gang of Four, says exactly that, find per pertinent objects. Yeah, this is what you're doing. I just create a class for each of those yellow names there, and it's fine. The point of ubiquitous language, the language of the business, and the term ubiquitous language is just the jargon of DDD for the language of the business, says that one clear thing, that in any software model you use for this domain, voucher is a name that matters. And uh, in no form of written and spoken communication within the project, so no email, no uh, text message, no WhatsApp message, no voice message, no documentation, no technical documentation, no technical specification, in no form of communication between the themes involved in the project should be used to indicate a prepaid token for buying things, anything but voucher. Synonyms like coupon, gift card, or any other name you can think of are just out of place. Now, this is a very basic point about the ubiquitous language, which is a glossary of terms, words, and verbs that truly 
and really reflect the real semantics of the business domain. Semantics from the dictionary that indicates the meaning or an interpretation of the meaning of a word, sign, sentence, and so forth. Apparently, this has nothing or very little to do with software development, but it's critical for building later software effectively. But it's just one point. Uh, let, let me show you how it, this, this applies. The ubiquitous language applies to what we do when we write software. Imagine now a team, stakeholders, customers, and software developers, architects, that discuss at work defining the ubiquitous language. There is a team of people, the technical people, they think and talk typically about we de have to write the module that deletes the booking or submits the order or update the job or create the invoice or set the state of the game depending on whatever is the real domain. But there's another bunch of people, the customers, that, well, they can have a hard time understanding uh, what is exactly delete a booking. They probably can understand, can have half an idea, but they feel a lot more comfortable if delete the booking becomes, in the end, cancel the booking. Because in the business, they don't delete, but they typically cancel. Uh, to us, developers, deletion means removing something from a place, from a store. In the real business, it's very, very unusual that pieces of information are just discarded, physically removed. For the most part, we do, we, um, in the business, there is a logical cancellation that lasts for a few years and then, after a few years, disappears sometimes physically from uh, databases, records, persistent stores. So delete the booking is probably better rendered with a different terminology, cancel the booking, submit the order becomes check out, update the job order becomes extend the job order or accept the invoice or start pause the game. It's the same, I mean, we are talking about one piece of behavior but the way in which we call that behavior makes a huge difference and it's not just terminology. There's more because this terminology, the ubiquitous language, should be, must be maintained, implemented, encoded, and should rule the way in which we name classes, methods, whatever, the software, the visible pieces of the software model. So today, what really matters in software? So the challenges we have to take seriously, language, ubiquitous language, language of the business, and the semantics of the words in, the, in that language, data, and documents. And the two things are strictly related. When we, as a first thing, reason about, okay, what could be a combination of tables, story procedures, views, constraints, foreign key relationships that allows me to move data around the modules to arrange a behavior as the customers want. When I do that, I'm actually modeling the reality as I understand, as I see well, actually, as I understand the reality. What we have to do to write effective software, especially today that software is going to be, if it's not already, so pervasive, it's part of the life, it's our life. Without software, I mean, that we, we go back straight to the Middle Age. But just to, you know, to, to quote a couple of facts from uh, the news of these days, the plane crash in Europe, in France. Okay, it, it's a tough problem. Security in the cockpit of a plane. There's no easy answer there. But one of the options that people, that experts, will be discussing in the, in the near, in the coming months is uh, 
if it's an option to have a plane fully driven by software, only software, no pilots, like a drone, it's an option. And the, the si I don't know if this will ever become a reality, but the simple fact that the, it's an option to be considered demonstrates how software is critical in the society, in, the, in, in, in our life, in our everyday life today. And we are still modeling as the first thing. We don't have to model, we have to stop model, we have to mirror. Mirror, so instead of what we understand of a domain, what we see should be mirrored in software. And in this context, data and documents play a significant role. I'm not saying that a relational model is out of place. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's a clear responsibility of the developers, the, the architects, the lead developers, to uh, understand as a first thing, okay, what kind of data are being used in this business context? What is the form? Are they documents? Are they, I don't know, groups of values associated together in some way, aggregated in some way? Not necessarily the best way to render the data as we observe data, looking at the events and the facts of the business model, the business domain, I'm sorry. Uh, not necessarily a relational model is the most effective. But rendering data as they are used and then as they are perceived by users of the system, that's critical, a lot more critical today than it's ever been in the entire history of software. And third, user experience. These three things are related, are strictly related. Because today we no longer have a, a passive mass of users humbly accepting any UI enforcement. Oh, this is the interface. That's it. It's not clear. It's your fault. Spend time, train yourself, and, and learn how to use the software. That's the tool. But it's horrible. That's it. Another acronym. Come on. <laughs> Let's call it UX-driven design. Um, I was used to use the term UX first, but UX-driven design is even better. And it has uh, a few aspects. It's uh, top-down. Top-down. Which yeah, represents a clear signal of difference compared to the current approach, which was bottom-up. This is top-down. It's task-based, yeah, yeah, because we, to mirror, instead of modeling, we look at events and what happens. We, we ask questions and we can only, as the first thing, can only make sense of, the, of what people do. What's your job? What do you do in the company? Tell me about your tasks. And then starting from there, from the user tasks, we arrange an experience, a user experience that works. And only at that point, once we have a clearly defined screens for each of the forms of interaction between the users and the system, we start planning the back end. And at that point, we know very well the data we have to put in the UI, the data we have to process. And at that point, we can even figure out what is the most effective and scalable way to keep storage in sync with uh, the rest of the system. Mood. It's not mud. Okay, what is what it means, water, and, you know, and 
<laughs> it's snow, it melted snow. Uh, but it's a minimal upfront design. Over the years, uh, there was something called the big upfront design. What a four like methodology. We want to be agile. Agile is, it's a matter of fact. It's not something you can, uh, you, you, you can question. But probably to write more effective software, a sort of minimal upfront design, but limited to the user interface. I'm not, I'm not saying to the entire, uh, expanded to the entire system. Minimal upfront design, and minimal means limited to the user experience. That helps. And this automatically takes us towards another aspect. Polyglot. Okay, I, I left only polyglot here because it, polyglot means when you speak, oh, it means when, when you're not American. Uh, you, you, know, <laughs> you know the joke about Americans, right? You know, that, uh, how, how do you call people who speak three languages? Oh, trilingual. And those who speak uh, two languages, bilingual. And those who speak just one language, oh, they're Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so, polyglot means that you speak several languages, uh, and one of which is the ubiquitous language. So, not, not Americans, you, you ubiquitous. But also, polyglot indicates multiple languages throughout the, 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 the tiers of the system, so UI and persistence. And this relates to what I said, I mean, 30 seconds, 40 seconds ago, that essentially data, the shape of data, it's critical and not necessarily the best way to deal with the data as we see being used in the domain is relational or is another. So polyglot means the ability to deal with data in the natural format of the data itself. So in three easy steps, UX-driven design that in my, again, humble opinion, addresses the challenges of today's software are, number one, build up user interface screens as users love them. This I mean, it sounds like it may sound like, you know, oh, <laughs> yeah, obvious. It's patent. <laughs> and you, f you flew from Italy up here just to say, oh, build user inter nice user interfaces. No. There is a clear return on investment, a clear ROI here. It doesn't reduce to zero, but it mitigates significantly. Those nasty situations in which you deliver the software and the customers look at you and say, <laughs> nice, but I wanted something different. I didn't mean this. <laughs> if you can, before you start doing serious work on the entire system, you do some minimal upfront design and ensure through wireframes, typically, sketches and wireframes, and maybe animated wireframes that show the sequence of screens as the user perform a task, each task users are expected to perform through the system. If you do that, if you have users to sign off on those screens, at that point you can easily define workflows from there because you know which, what you have to produce. So it's easy to inherit classes that produce, that expose data to populate those screens and classes that grab input from those screens and start the workflows in the middle tier. So you know input and output of workflows. And from workflows, at that point, you can connect to the existing or newly created business logic, but it's critical that you sign off there. Minimal upfront design. And now, to be honest, uh, I love UX driven design, and uh, in, my, in the, the little space of my company, that, that's the way we work. And uh, 
we write for the most part software for internal purposes. So we don't, we, we are not a consulting company. I mean, I, I'm talking about my personal company now, not JetBrains. Um, we write software mostly for internal purposes, but our software is uh, used by operators all over the world in uh, very you know, tough situations because they are sometimes under unreliable internet connection, uh, under pressure. My company provides IT services for sport events in you know, any part of the world, mostly rainforests. And uh, this means that you know, internet is unreliable. There's a rush to have the job done, the user experience, the user interface, providing exactly what they need to do the job quickly and effectively without mistakes the first time, right the first time, it's absolutely critical. And UX-driven design has helped us significantly because it well, had the effect of just dropping maintenance efforts because we know exactly what we have to produce. And we go straight there. there there's no risk. Oh, it's very limited. The risk that somebody comes back and says, oh, but this is not so good as you told us, or this is completely wrong. We need a different UI, a different experience. It's too, too slow, too, too bad. It speeds development because it speeds up development because uh, you know what you have to do. I mean, you don't have to think. It's already decided. A small, minimal, upfront design. It simplifies designs and smooth the evolution of the product. And it's polyglot, again. And, and polyglot in terms of the language of the business because you can talk back to customers where something is wrong and the customer will use it, their own language to complain. And the language the customer use, it's the ubiquitous language of the business. It's also the language of the names of the methods of the classes, the procedures you have in code. So it's an obvious one-to-one -one match between words. And also the data that the customer may have found wrong or inaccurate uh, at some point of the, of the system working, and it complains about an invoice being, I don't know, inaccurate in some way, you don't have to go and aggregate mentally or physically three records from 300 database tables. If it's an invoice rendered as the invoice is conceived in the real business domain, well, you have some data that is not relational but represents the invoice for what it is. Polyglot again. So the answer, why do we write software is to make it work right, right away and move ourselves next to, the, to another project. So it's all about uh, the user experience. It's not about simply the interface and that's it follow me <laughs> thank you very much for your time okay we have, we have a we have help oh questions yeah questions 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 can I ask a question myself? Dino, what do you think about the, the presenter here? <laughs> I love the presenter. It's, it has its own life. So, okay, go, go with questions. Dino, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So much energy. 16 coffee I took this morning did make, wake me the way your energy speeded things up. So, thank you. Okay, so the question about the things you told. Uh, let's go back to Mr. Henry Ford and his clients. Uh, so can, we can I go back with the slides uh, as well? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, so we listen to his clients, uh, check out the language, data, and user experience, but still it's horses, fast horses. How do we jumpstart from mm, speed horses to you know actual 
Car. No, uh, well, the, okay, uh, I, got, I think I got a question. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good catch because uh, making uh, that switch, the shift actually, from horses to cars, I put it down simply in terms of, uh, okay, if you do a good design, you understand the real mechanics of the business, then you should be able to see that, you know, Horses are great, but they are limited in some way. They don't scale much. And uh, to scale the movement beyond the level of horses, you need something different and form the cr created cars. Uh, to be honest, uh, a serious uh, consulting company uh, does maybe may, may offer two distinct types of services. One is building software to mirror the existing set of processes and uh, expanding, extending, recreating, rewriting processes is all another kind of business, kind of job, requires different expertise. So uh, to understand, to figure out that horses don't scale beyond a certain point and you need something different, that's probably outside the realm of software architects. Software architects uh, are probably good enough uh, if they can just create horses that run faster. So it was a, uh, the, the point of my slide was uh, on the border, okay, of what is real and what was just there to, to, to try to, you know, capture your attention and uh, and make you uh, think about you know where the horses, hands, and cars begin. So good point. Other questions? There was one in the back. Few in the back there. Hi, you know, uh, thank you for the okay. marvelous presentation. Uh, it was very energetic. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, if we have a legacy project. Uh, which uh, recommendation you would uh, take to us uh, if you want to apply this uh, DDD or uh, UX uh, model to legacy projects? Um, there is another concept uh, in domain-driven design, what, another fundamental concept that I, you know, in 30 minutes was really hard to mention. I could have mentioned the word, but uh, you that mean you that mentioned very little without further explanation. But the second key concept uh, beyond ubiquitous language in domain-driven design is bounded context. Now, a bounded context is an area of the application, an area of the domain, actually, uh, that you think, for whatever reason, is better, more effectively treated as a separate piece of code. Uh, so, after the ubiquitous language, as you proceed with the analysis, the purpose should be identifying one or possibly more multiple bounded contexts and relate them as nodes on a graph with arcs and each arc denotes a particular type, typically master, slave or partner uh, relationship. Uh, so, I'm not saying that each of these bounded contexts which deserve their own implementation, independent implementation, form a SOA system in which everything is a standalone autonomous module. It could be that some of these bounded contexts are class libraries in the context of the same ASP.NET project. But one of these bounded contexts certainly can be legacy code. Another classic example of a bounded context is an external, any external service, web services, for example, that you need to call. So legacy code is a code that works and that you, you are afraid to touch because if, you know, if I recompile that, or I don't even know if it recompiles, uh, <laughs> so you, 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 you keep it as is, you, don't, you want to treat in, in a sort of black box and uh, yeah, so the bounded context concept in DDD is the perfect way to address legacy code. Yeah. Hi, Dina. Hi. Thank you very much for your very interesting speech. Too kind. Uh, we, are, uh, we are doing such way uh, right now, but I don't have uh, good uh, courses 
to learn. Uh, Mine. To le okay. Uh, uh, could you recommend uh, some URL maybe when we can see uh, good examples? Uh, we have uh, a book of Eric Evans and uh, my words <laughs> right now. Uh, could you recommend something better? Okay. Um, I, I think that in, in the, the book from uh, Eric Evans, the blue book, that is the foundation of domain driven design is still an excellent reference, but I will call your attention on one fact. Uh, Eric Evans himself, five years later, so 2009, uh, gave a talk in London. You can even, if you go on YouTube and, try and make a search for Eric, Eric Evans QCon uh, 2009, there is a video uh, of the talk he gave, and the title of the talk was What I Have Learned Myself about DDD in five years. And uh, the fundamental point it makes in that presentation, uh, in a way, contradicts the content of the book, in the sense that it said, it, it's probably time that we change the priorities of points of DDD. The book, bl the blue book, is written in such a way, the most important part of DDD seems to be building an object model for the domain. And uh, there are a lot of guidelines on how to build objects with factories, uh, with uh, uh, only getters, uh, with uh, aggregates, uh, uh, with uh, uh, value types, and so forth. And then after that, in the second half of the book, it mentions ubiquitous language, bounded context. And in, in that talk, he says, well, it would be much better if we invert the order of importance and presentation of these two things. So the blue book is great, but you must be aware that th the most part of DDD, the most value is in ubiquitous language and bounded context. So more modern and recent uh, resources for domain-driven designs uh, well, uh, I have a book out, um, uh, uh, sorry for the shameless plug, uh, which was went out in September, <coughs> and so there, there's a book of mine, uh, which is probably the only book at the moment, because it's the latest, okay, uh, that takes this sort of modern approach. There is, uh, I, found, I found that out uh, maybe a week ago, that there is a, a review on Amazon, so you can publicly check it out if you want, that says that the book that I wrote, uh, uh, according to the reviewer, clears out a lot of confusion he had built after reading a couple of other books, not including the Evans book, on DDD. So, I don't know, I, mean, I would say my book, and I will have also a, a class online on plural site, not ready yet, but it should be ready in summertime. So, mm, send royalties my way, thank you. Uh, we are sorry, we, have, uh, we haven't much time for uh, questions. Uh, okay. So, Dino Esposito. Thank you very much.